All right, ready? Shall we get started? Oh, let's close the door again. Cannot escape. <laughs> okay, so what I want to do today, I want to do several things. I definitely want to finish the Gram Schmidt business. We briefly started last time. <coughs> and tell you about your factorization. So I guess finish finish off uh, least squares, how to solve it nicely. But <coughs> I, uh, the other thing I wanted to do is to clarify some confusions that arose on the project number four and from coding because I was going through the piazza and it was a mess. I realized that the maybe maybe the best thing would be to just talk about it because like some people post something, some people answer something, some people are confused. So like the forum only goes that far. I guess at some point it's better to just talk talk about it. <coughs> some of you already figured it all out, so 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 that's good. So let's look at it a little bit. There is not that many things that can go wrong in the in your transform coding project, but you, <laughs> some of you at least, like all, all of you together collectively, you explore pretty much all everything that can possibly go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's take a look at the things that can go wrong. And if you or if you have some already or some something new that wasn't posted on Piazza yet, then just. Then just tell me, and we can we can we can discuss it like right now. I don't want to extend it any further. But I was actually thinking, by the way, this is this is what the have you heard about this re reverse classroom type of thing? Do do some classes do that already? I was actually thinking it would probably make a lot of sense, like lo looking looking on what's what's going on. Thinking about it, I didn't want to really do it because I barely started teaching, so I didn't want to like do some crazy things uh, first, but. I think actually make a lot of sense because you just you could just watch the lectures at home and we could basically do work on the homework together in the class. <laughs> it's probably not gonna happen here. I don't wanna switch like halfway through, but maybe I could do it and do it next. Actually, so let's let's try like a little bit of that, like like a beta version of that, like right now. So about about the transform coding. Even even those of you who already like figured it out, that might be useful to re realize what what other things can go wrong. <coughs> so the one thing, the one thing some people struggle with what were, the, were the SK coefficients here. Do you see that? Shall I shall I zoom it? I think there is a way to zoom in. So that is um, No, no. Okay, I think I can do this. Okay, so there's this formula here. That's the formula. So we are talking about DCP, right? How to how to compute that? So some people struggle with with the SK coefficients. So what are what are they for? Maybe someone. Maybe we can discuss about it. <coughs> So this is this is the formula for the element number i in vector k, right? And by the way, this is correct. Some people are also suspecting that maybe maybe this is wrong. <laughs> this is this is I guess the second, or I, I guess I can start with it. Like what what happens if you switch the i and k? What matrix will you get, right? If if I if I'm ultimately using the matrix q, which looks like I mean you can write it either way, right? I think I I personally would prefer. It doesn't really matter, but I guess I would do it this way, QN transpose, right? When I have, these are all vectors, I guess I could give them like little arrows to make, make it clear that they are vectors. And the elements of all the vectors, they are <coughs> in indexed by K, right? So if I take the vectors and put them into matrix Q, what, what happens if I switch the I and K in this expression? Yep. Transpose. I get exactly the transpose matrix. Yes, yes, yes. So it doesn't really. By the way, it doesn't really matter if you are if you are using this matrix. Then then your signal goes from the right, right? So you get the dot products. If I was using the other matrix, if I was using this matrix Q1 to Qn here. So with with this matrix, well, let me hmm, call it Q tilde. So here I would just use Qx, right? And here what I want to do, I want to do like Qxt, Q1 
queue tilde to compute the dot products, right? In both ways, it computes the same thing. So it doesn't matter which one you prefer, but, but you need to do it right. What, what, would, what would be wrong would be to do this Q tilde multiply from the right, right? Because then you are not really doing the dot products with, with the DCT basis functions. So that's one thing that can go wrong. <laughs> and some of you explored <laughs> this. What is the other thing that can go wrong? Yeah, what are the SK coefficients? That's what I uh, started. <coughs> why, why are they there? I thought that most of you already did it, so. <laughs> yep. Correct. It's just a global scale, right? Of this, this is a function to scale a multiple of it, right? So why do I need it there? Why do I bother about this <coughs> SKs there? Or better question is, what happens if I just don't have the SKs there? What if I just assume that SK is one? Some of you explored this. I'm not sure if they are here. <laughs> yep. That's correct, yeah. So if they are not orthonormal, they are they are still orthogonal, right? So that it will it will still be no matter how you choose the SKs, unless you may made them zero, that would be a very bad idea to make the SK zero, by the way. <laughs> uh, but it, no matter what you choose them to, it will always be true then QI transpose QJ will always be zero for I different from J, right? And what, what you were uh, correctly suggesting was that the SKs there are for uh, to make sure that if I do QI, TQI, then I normally would get some number, right? And I want to get one. And the SKs there are there, are the normalizing coefficients, so I get one. So what do I want to set the SKs to? I think most of you figured it out correctly. But can't hurt. <coughs> Exactly, exactly. So the SK should be set to one over the norm of QK, right? I'm not gonna tell you how to code it up in MATLAB, that, that you should figure out, but <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not giving up uh, everything, but yeah, that's, that's what it should be. If you do this, then certainly the dot product of the vector with itself will have length one, right? So that's that. Because another question was, what does it mean to eliminate coefficients with small magnitude? Well, that simply means that, that the guys that have small magnitude, you will make them zero, right? And the point of the compression is that you are not transmitting all the zeros. You just instead transmit the information, hey, I zeroed out this many coefficients, right? Which is, of course, much, much smaller piece of information. And then when you are doing the inverse DCT, then you, you need to plug the zeros back, but the point is you didn't need to transmit the zeros. I think <coughs> I skipped this because I thought this was obvious, but that's, that's how you achieve the compression, right? So if you are doing the 2D case on the, on the eight by eight blocks, you have 64 dimensional vectors, and maybe you can pick just the first 10 of them, so the remaining 54, you just make them zero, but that, does, that means that you don't have to transmit the zeros, right? Instead you say, hey, I zeroed out the last 54 elements, so whenever the decoder take, takes, takes um, your data, your compressed image, it knows that the, the fi last 54 is gonna be zero, and then it can do the inverse DCD. Yep, I guess most of you figured that out, so, but can't hurt to make that explicit. I'd like you to understand this because the transform coding is really cool. <laughs> I guess sometimes it can happen that you get it to work somehow and you are happy with it, but you still have like a question in the back of your mind. <coughs> Yeah, so the inverse DCD, some people were confused about that. What do I mean by inverse DCD? So if, the, if my, so let's, let's stick with this notation, let's forget about this, not stick with this one. If the Q is my forward DCD, what is the inverse DCD? <coughs> it's, it's again, I guess, I guess it's so obvious that I didn't even mention it. It's almost clear, but I guess pedagogically, I should have mentioned it. <laughs> So the inverse DCT take, takes the coefficients, right? The coefficients here, that's, that's the QX. If X was my signal, QX computes the coefficients. So like, I think I called them C in the, in the lecture when I talked about this. 
And if I want to go back to the signal, what do I need to do? That's, that's really simple. That's the inverse DCT. So what is that? So if, uh, let, me, let me pose the question this way. If Q is the matrix of the forward DCT, what is the matrix of the inverse DCT? Yeah? Hmm? Multiply x. Well, we are talking about so. Okay, let let let, okay, let me go slower a little bit. So this way, so the forward DCT that works like this. I do Q x right. Q is this matrix, and the rows are the individual bases uh, vectors of DCT right. As I was showing on the lecture, those are these these these. Basically, looks like this. There is a constant. There is one wave. There is two waves. There are three waves, and so on right. That's how the Q matrix visually looks like. <laughs> if you visualize <laughs> each, each of the rows, which, which you could, you should, you should have it computed. So the coefficients, the, the, or the, the, the DCT of the signal X, I get by applying the matrix Q, right? So the C is the application of DCT to X, or the, so you could be saying, you could be talking about a spectrum of the signal. If you wanna be more fancy, that's an actually a nice thing to say spectrum, the C. And the inverse DCT that goes back, uh, the inverse DCT takes at C, the spectrum, and returns back the signal X. So what is the matrix of the D inverse DCD? So that's, that's maybe too simple, so it's confusing, but there is, there is no trick. <laughs> It's no trick question. <laughs> Playing straight. <laughs> yeah, it's just Q transposed, exactly. So if the matrix of DCT is Q, then the, I guess, IDCD or whatever you want to call it, is Q transposed, right? Because you know that this is an orthonormal matrix. So if I do, if I do Q transpose C, that means Q transpose QX, but Q transpose Q, because it's orthonormal, that's identity, right? So this gives me back X, and that's what I want. That's, that's it. There is no, no magic to it. Or that's, that's all the magic, the orthonormality of the basis. Okay, yeah? In which I'm not sure which program are you talking about? Oh, okay. Oh, here. Okay, let's see. So first of all, I think this should be capital N, right? I think that's a typo. <coughs> So this here, okay, so uh, I guess you should have probably been trying to be more consistent with the notation. So here X is the spectrum, right? And here I want to reconstruct the original signal that that's, that's going to be my Y, right? So what I said before is that I would need to do Q transpose, um, I guess I used a little bit different notation here than here. So, sorry about that, but that's okay. So this should, this will be this, right? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's because I zoomed, so you can see this. Thing. There you go. <coughs> so here are computing the inverse DCT, so that's QTX. <coughs> and the QT, well, that makes perfect sense, right? The QT is this. The QT is Q1 up to QN, right? And the X by coordinates is X1 to xn, right? So if you if you look at these as column vectors, that's that's what these guys are. Then the sum is exactly the same thing as the matrix vector multiplication, right? There's always multiple ways to look at the same expression, right? I can write this as a sum if you want. I can write it there again. It's k from one to n. Let's make it capital N so it uh, is compatible. And this xk and q. Okay. Okay. Mm 
Yeah, I didn't really expect this to generate so much confusion. <laughs> anything, anything else there that's still unclear? What, what's the definition of compression ratio? <coughs> well, I think like the very general definition is the, the size of your compressed output divided by the size of the input, right? But, but in, this, in this particular homework, I think what, what I meant was the number of non-zero coefficients, the number of coefficients you are transmitting, divided by the number of original coefficients. But wasn't there's like zero, co there's some that coefficients that already be zero before. Why did you take that into account? Before you zero them out? Yeah. So this is, this is, yeah, this is a good question. This is like a, like a nuance, like a detail of the encoder stage, right? <coughs> so what, what would happen in like JPEG on like an actual encoder and decoder? Like, it's like a communication thing, right? So I have, I'm taking the signal somewhere, I'm encoding it, I compress it, I take this package of compressed information, transmit it somewhere to a receiver, and the re receiver needs to be able to decode it without any external information, right? That's, that's, that's the whole idea. So here I would sort of need to uh, come up with some protocol, what, what exactly is in this compressed package. So we, are, we sort of sh short circuited the process here, even like JPEG gets more complicated, right? <coughs> because uh, the DCT is just one part of the process. The second part is how exactly you're going to encode the truncated DCT coefficients, right? So uh, back to your question, can you remind me what did you ask exactly? Uh, well, what if there are any coefficients that are zero before? Right, so if some of them were zero, like in, in this particular case, we don't care. It doesn't make a difference. If they happen to be exactly zero, whatever. We just zero them up no matter what, I mean. So, so the compression ratio, when I calculate compression ratio, that wouldn't care no, in this case. That wouldn't care. Just discard them, whatever they are. If they happen to be zero, sure, it doesn't zero, matter. Not zero over total number of coefficients. Right, right, right. So the, I guess you could say the number of transmitted coefficients versus the number of total coefficients, right? There's this fun little problem that we are, as we are already talking about compression. Can you have a compression algorithm that produces zero size output? No information in it, too. <laughs> uh, sounds like no way, right? But, but you can actually do that. <laughs> it's just it's just a funny thing, right? Like imagine like like a comp what does a compression algorithm do? A compression algorithm takes some input and produces some output, right? And then and if it's a if it's a correct compression algorithm, it needs to be able to decompress the output back to the input, right? But I can easily define a compression algorithm that if it takes for example, hello as input, it produces empty output, and a decompression will be check if it's empty, and if it's empty output, he'll hello, and on everything, everything else do nothing, right? It's just it's silly, silly stuff about compression, as, as, as we already broached the topic. But that, that was not the point here. Like, if you wanted to do the compression properly, that you would probably want to be compressing the, the DCT coefficients. That's what actually JPEG is doing. I forgot the exact algorithm there. But it's doing something smart to transmit even the remaining DCT coefficients, right? You can, can probably quantize them with different, different levels and so on. But here I just wanted to explore the, the, the main idea. This is really the main idea, though. This is why it compresses so well, right? This is why your, your photos uh, are uh, much smaller than they would be uncompressed in JPEG. Okay, anything else here? <coughs> Any other points of confusion? <laughs> yeah? On the image Ah, right, right, right. I was expecting some questions there because there is. No, the entire block, right? So <coughs> this, um, I think I discussed this on the lecture. So you can, um, this is an n by eight block of pixels, right? So 64 pixels, right? So you can unroll this matrix into a vector, 64 dimensional vector, and you apply the DCT <laughs> to that, right? You could, in theory, certainly apply DCT to the columns or rows individually, right? You could like treat it as like a 1D signal, right? Nothing stops you from doing that. It would do some compression, but the point, if, what, what, what do you think would happen if you did that? You can, you can try, it, and it would do something, but what do you think it would do there? If I applied the DCD to every column uh, individually, would it be good compression? Would it be better compression than this, or would it be worse? 
<laughs> That's a 50% chance of getting it right, which is a pretty good deal. <laughs> it would be worse, right? Why do you think it would be worse? If you think about it, the, the, the reason why compression works is because there are redundancies in the signal, right? I was before arguing that the signals are nice and smooth, that they usually don't vary like crazy, at least for most parts, and most parts is what matters, right? If you had a random image, if you had noise, this would not work very well, right? So this, this, this works under assumption that the signals are nice and smooth, right? And if I have a 2D signal, well, then you have it nice and smooth in two directions, in the X and Y direction, right? In both of them, because there is really no, no reason to treat them differently, right? If you, if you turn your camera, then your X axis becomes the Y axis, but that, that doesn't really change the properties of the image, right? So that means that in image, there are uh, correlations both in X and in Y directions, and that's what the 2D uh, DCT takes advantage of. That's why we do it on the entire blocks. That's actually great. Thanks, thanks a lot for bringing this up. I, I think I should have mentioned this. Again, this is something I take for granted. It's not for granted. So yeah, the 2D DCT takes advantage of the fact that the entire blocks, entire little squares, are nicely coherent. If you look just on the columns, they would also be nicely coherent, but you would be not taking advantage of the fact that the coherency exists both in the x direction and the y direction. Yeah? Okay, so I'm a little bit confused by the volume and versus vector. So yeah, like... Um, it's a vector, yeah, but the, the vector is basically a matrix in a disguise, right? Because if I... So yeah, okay, it's, it's a little bit... Okay, I, I didn't really want to go back. <laughs> yeah. The thing is that, okay, let me, let me do the quick... Exp so this is, this is the DCT basis, I still have it here, right? And the thing is that it is still working with vectors, but this is just like the way we code it. So we have like, so it's easier for us to code it up. Because the, the vectors are really unrolled matrices, right? It's still basically, it's looking at the matrices, working totally with the matrices. Just that we convert the matrices into vectors so we can call the same formulas. Okay. You could, you, you totally can like reason about dot products of matrices and so on. And if you do that, then, then you end up uh, working with tensors, which is not a, not a disaster, but it's a little bit more difficult to think about than, than just converting the matrices to vectors. So I prefer this way. Okay, is that clear now? <laughs> okay, great. Anything else regarding project number four, which is due tomorrow, right? Yep. So uh, I just want to understand like, the concept of taking the outer product. Mm -hmm. So it's like it just gives me the every possible combination of the two ways that how I should see it. Exactly, yeah. So let's, I mean, I guess the easiest would be to, I don't think I have a MATLAB here, but let me try to explain it on a piece of paper. If you work, by the way, the best way to learn things is just by running experiments in MATLAB. <laughs> so the outer product does, okay, I need to zoom back. Too much, right? This shouldn't work. So if I have two uh, vectors, they wouldn't have to be the <laughs> same length. So actually, let's let's do let's do different length vectors. That's not what we need in DCT, but the outer product totally works this way too, right? So this would be an n by one vector, and this would be one by m vector, and the outer product is a matrix, which is an n by m matrix. Okay. And what the matrix, you can look at the matrix in two ways. So first, if you call this guy A, and if you say the coefficients of this are B1, B2, up to Bm, then what's gonna be in this matrix? The thing is gonna be AB1, AB2, up to ABm, right? That's purely from the definition of matrix multiplication, right? So what you are, if you have like some sort of like sine, sine wave here, what you are doing is you are multiplying by all the coefficients, the columns, right? The other way you can look at this 
equivalent way, of course, is that you I will look at the components, of the coordinates of A, and I will say that my B is, I will say just B transpose, like a vector. So equivalently, you can look at it. What do you, what do you think is coming here? I should be able to, A1, B transpose, right? It would be the first row, A2, B transpose, up to a n b transpose so again if i have some sort of wrinkle wave here then what the outer product does it multiplies it by all these coefficients right and that's exactly how we arrived to, to this picture right because like for example this this one here oh sorry it's refocus refocusing so he, this 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 guy here here in the x-axis i have one uh, sine wave in the other axis I have a constant right and here this guy here I have wave in Y a vertical wave and horizontal wave if I do the outer product this is exactly what it does make sense what is the rank of outer product matrix what is the rank of these matrices you can think of it as a quick midterm recap The problems in the midterm will, of course, be more difficult than that. As, as a disclaimer, those are like baby problems. If I ask what is the rank of this matrix, <laughs> now if, we, if you don't know that, that, that makes me a little bit worried. <laughs> huh? Any other opinions? <laughs> yeah. Okay, you. Did you look at, by the way, did you look at the midterm practice problems? You should, because uh, the midterm is next week. On Monday, there will be solutions of it. Oh, by the way, okay, again, I'm not posting any uh, homework or project because what I want you to do is to practice for the midterm. And the way you, you can practice is by looking at the practice problems. And the other way on that, that goes to another question on Piazza uh, is by looking at this book, which is, which is a very nice book. Oh, OK. I can do, do this. And if you look at chapters 1 through 4, orthogonality, that's, that's, this is what we are going to end with today, Gram Schmidt. The terminals, that's what we are going to do after the midterm. So the, the rest of the stuff is going to be in your final. But here we have all these problems. Like if, 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 you, if, if you go through it, you will actually find like a ton of problems. <coughs> here you get like the, the geometric interpretation of solving systems of linear equations and so on. So if you want to solve some matrix problems and you want to solve some matrix problems because that's what's going to be in your midterm. Let me show it here actually so you have an idea. In case you didn't look at it, then you should look at it. I wanted to spend some time at the end by looking at this. I'm not, I'm not sure if you'll have much time anymore. So this is this is a similar type of problems as you will have in the midterm. So please look at it and try to solve it for yourselves. You should be able to solve this just using pen and paper, nothing else. I know you're the generation that like uses Google uh, every, every, everywhere. <laughs> but uh, this, you should be able to solve just using pen and paper. <laughs> so as I said on Monday, you, you will give you solutions to the midterm practice problem. So I strongly encourage you to try to solve it by yourself before Monday, because if you start later that will be too late and on Wednesday I will be back and, uh, and I will, I will, we will do the midterm okay and I would expect you to be able to answer immediately questions like what is the rank of these matrices <laughs> and the rank is of course one right because all of the columns here are lin linear combinations of the same column and all the rows here are linear combinations of the same row and we know that column rank and row rank must be the same in both cases it's one Okay, that's that's uh, that's the absolute basics. 
Okay, anything else? Or can I go and finish up the Gram Schmidt process? If you still have time at the end, then I, then, then I can talk a little bit more about the practice problems. <coughs> so let's do Gram Schmidt now. So what was the input of Gram-Schmidt? The input was n linearly independent vectors and vectors from Rm space, which are linearly independent. And the output, do you remember what was the output? The sort of vectors q1 up to qn, of course, from the same vector space, which are orthonormal orthonormal and most importantly the span of q1 qn is the same as the span of the vectors I had on the input a1 to a n okay it's not that hard to modify it so that it can accept literally <coughs> dependent vectors and I will explain you how after I explain the basics of the gram schmidt process so basically it works I guess you can you can pose it in many ways. I, I like this form that in the first step you create an orthogonal basis. So that will be B1 up to Bn. So these vectors are orthogonal but not necessarily orthonormal, just like I discussed the, the, the mysterious S coefficient. So I'm sorry, let's get out of uh, focus. And step number two, you normalize them to create an orthonormal basis. The step number two is really, really easy, right? That's bi divided by the norm of bi. Okay. So the step two is a joke. That's that's easy to normalize the vector, except that you must not <laughs> forget <laughs> forget to actually do it. And the step number one, that's that's what we will talk about now. That's the main idea of the Gram-Schmidt process. And it works like this. So uh, I start, so my B1 is just going to be, I, you know what, I will use this as an assignment operator. Okay. B1 will be assigned the value of A1. Okay. You know what, let me explain it for n equals 3. So I don't have to go crazy with the indices. But then it will be <coughs> obvious how, how it will proceed. So I start by taking B1, I'll set B1 to A1. That's what I meant by this uh, notation. And then for B2, what I'm going to do, I will take my next vector A2 and I will subtract off the component of A2, which already is contained in the subspace. That's the main idea in words. I will write it now in symbols and then I will draw the picture. So if this is my vector a1, then my b1 vector is the same, right? So that, that's also b1. And if this is my vector a2, then what this means, this is what we discussed before. This is, this is the projection on a one-dimensional subspace, right? So I basically, uh, what I'm going to do, I'll find the projection, and I will keep only this component. And this is what I will call b2. Right. We already discussed this, this expression at length before, so I don't want to go there again. What this does, it finds me the component of A2, which is orthogonal to this subspace generated by B1 or A1. Okay? And that's really the idea of Gram-Schmidt. Because in the next step, when I get uh, when the third vector comes in, A3, what I'm going to do, I will do B3 equals A3 minus and the same sort of idea, but now applied to the two-dimensional subspace. So subtract of the component in B1. And I also <coughs> subtract the component in B2. So you can imagine some third vector that goes out of plane came in. What I'm going to do, I'm going to decompose it into the directions B1 and B2. They are already orthogonal, so that's, that's easy, right? And if I divide it, I made them orthonormal. So that's why that's a projection of the A3 vector onto these, on, onto these uh, basis vectors. 
and I'll keep only the part of A3 which is not in this subspace. That's, that's what this means, right? And if I have fourth vector and so on, then I do the same thing, then I would subtract all three and so on. You got it? That's, that's how Gram-Schmidt works. By the way, one cool thing about the Gram-Schmidt is that I don't even need to have all the input vectors in memory available because they can be coming to me one at a time. Like if I'm in some sort of like transmission scenario when, when the vectors just like somebody keeps sending me the vectors, I can just be computing it uh, online. I can be updating in one vector at a time. It's a nice example of an online algorithm. It means that you don't really have to store it on, like imagine this matrix is like ginormous. It's like data, right? big data type of thing. It's like a huge hard drive <laughs> and you cannot load it into memory. And that's cool because you don't need to load it in memory because you need to only take one at a time. It's just, just, just a side note. But what, uh, you, you, can, you can safely forget about this, but please, <coughs> please remember the, the Gramschmidt process, okay? Because what the Gramschmidt, why, why is the Gramschmidt process important? Because it converts me uh, general basis. So this is a basis, right, for the span, right? This is a basis. I hope you know what is a basis. <laughs> or you re remember what is a basis. Literally independent vector that generates some, some subspace. So this is, this is a basis for the subspace. And the Gram-Schmidt, the importance of Gram-Schmidt comes from the fact that it generates an orthonormal basis from a linearly independent basis. It turns linearly independent basis into an orthonormal basis, right? And we discussed before that orthonormal bases have um, make our life much easier because they have uh, this nice property that QTQ equals identity. That's, that's the same, by the way, we were using in transform coding, right? Okay, let me do a numerical example to give you a more concrete idea of Gram-Schmidt. Let's see if I can squeeze it in here. So let's say I'm giving, given these three vectors, that my A1 will be 1, minus 1, 0. My A2 will be 2, 0, minus 2. My A3 is going to be 3, minus 3, and 3. So what the Gramschmidt is gonna do? Well, first, the first step is trivial, right? B1 will be just copy. Not a big problem. And now what's gonna be B2? So B2, uh, by this <coughs> formula, that's A2 minus, minus this, right? So let me try to compute it for you. I prefer, instead of computing B1, B1 transpose uh, A2, I can just say that, okay, let me write it here. I can instead do this. I can do B1 here, and here I will compute B1 transpose A2 divided by B1 T B1. Okay, so I don't have to do any funny business with outer products. So that means that's A2 minus B1, and how much is this if I plug in these values? So this is the dot product of B1 and A2, right? How much is that? That looks like two to me. Please check it that I'm not doing it wrong. And the norm of B1, that also looks like 2, right? So this looks like A2 minus B1. So if I plug in there the values, I will get 2, 0, minus 2, minus B1. So that means minus this, which gives me 1, 1, mm -hmm. minus 2. Did I do it right? So that's the, that's the second one. That's, that's the B2 returned by, <laughs> by, by gentlemen Graham and Schmidt. Okay, B3, well, that's the formula, right? Let me, let me use the same trick to make the computations a little bit easier. So this is B1 T A3, B1 T B1, minus, as you see, it's sort of silly not to normalize already. Maybe I should have like normalized immediately rather than saying it's in the second step, but whatever. Uh, and here is B2, B2 transpose A3 divided by B2 square norm. So let's plug in the values. So what is this thing gonna be? B1 dot product A3. By the way, this type of calculation, that's, that's, our, that's the level of mathematics I expect you to be able to do in your head in, in the midterm, right? Like the dot product of B1 and A3. So that looks like six to me. <coughs> 
So this looks like six. And B1, that's still gonna be two, right? Because it was two before. And minus B2, and now I need a dot product B2 and A3. So B2 is this, this one, B2 and A3. So that's three minus three, that's zero, minus six. So there is a minus six, and the norm of B2 is how much? You tell me. The square. Uh, the square norm, right? B, B2 transpose B2. Six. six, yes. So let's put it together. So it'll be A3 minus 3B2, and this looks like plus Oh, sorry, B1. See, there is a mistake. It's you're almost guaranteed to make a mistake in, in things like this, okay? But you just need to find them and correct them. That's that's the name of the game. <laughs> so if I put it together, I get 3 minus 3, 3 minus 3 times B1. So that's 1 minus 1, 0, and plus B2 which would be one, one minus two. Well, let's see, what do, we, what do we get? So we get three minus three, that's zero and one, right? So here we get one. Minus three plus three, that's again zero. And here we get again one. This is three, this is zero. Three minus two will be again one. What a coincidence. So this is all ones. So this is my B3. I just manage to use the paper and that's the output of Gramschmidt and you can check or we can check that this is indeed orthogonal basis right it's not orthonormal yet how would I make it orthonormal well that's that's an easy thing right I would just say this would be 1 over square root of 2 1 minus 1 0 q2 would be how much 1 over square root of 6 one, one minus two, and Q3 would be one over square root of three for a change, one, one, one. So this would be like the final result, okay? So let's, let's try if they are orthogonal. So let's do dot product of B1 and B2. So I get one minus, yeah, that's, that's zero. B1 and B3, that's also <laughs> zero. And B2 and B3, that's also zero. So I think I got it right. Okay, th things like this you will uh, do in the midterm. So if you don't practice it, you will uh, not do very well. You need to practice this a little bit. <laughs> Have you seen the in, in my Kellen? YouTube video. <laughs> if you will not revise for your mid, uh, midterm, you shall not pass. <laughs> it's more funny from Emma Cowan. <laughs> okay, so that's that's the basic Gram Schmidt. Uh, Gram Schmidt is one way we can compute QR factorization. Any questions to this? No. Is that is that, is that cool? All right, so let's wait, I wanted to do, so this, this all is summarized on this slide, which I, I, I think I uploaded to Canvas, so we, do, we don't have to go through it again, we do it last time. What I, oh wait, no, I want to go to uh, QR factorization now. Because, <coughs> so there is a, one way you can interpret the output of the Gramscian process is uh, QR factorization. We have previously talked about LU factorization, which uh, decomposes a matrix into lower and upper triangular, right, LU. And QR is a, another uh, important type of matrix factorization, which decomposes a matrix into a uh, matrix with orthonormal columns and upper triangular. So let me first describe it in the case when the matrix, uh, when my input matrix A it's an M by N matrix. And let's first assume that A has full column rank. So full column rank means that the column rank is N. It's only going to work for tall 
and skinny matrices, right? Because we know that short and fat matrices, they couldn't possibly have full column rank. And uh, notice how uh, the Gram-Schmidt process worked, okay? When we created the first basis vector, the Q1, then the first input vector was in the subspace generated by A1, right? So I can write it like this. So the A1, that's the input vector to Gram-Schmidt, was in the span of Q1, right? Trivially, because Q1 was just a normalized A1, right? More, interesti more interestingly, A2 was also in the span of Q1 and Q2, right? Because we created Q2 exactly in such a way that we can get A2 in that, in that subspace. Same, same way A3 was in the span of Q1, Q2, and Q3, and so on, right? So what does it mean that for A1, I can, just, I can write A1 as a scale version of Q1, right? Same way I can write A2 as a linear combination of Q1 and Q2 where the coefficients of the linear combination are the dot products. Because the vectors Q1 and Q2 are unit length, then this is exactly the projection, the length of the projection, okay? And the same way for all, all the other ones. So in general, for vector number n, uh, I get this expression. So if I write this in matrix form, that's, that's the same thing we discussed at the beginning. How do you like the, the sum form as opposed to matrix form? This equivalently written in matrices is this, right? Let's, let's look at it for a second. What does it mean? This means that the first column here is this multiplied by the first column here, right? The second column here means that I take Q1 this plus Q2 this, right? So this matrix multiplication encodes exactly the same information as, as these sums here. <coughs> Does everybody see that? Again, referring to your center of the brain for matrix uh, vector multiplication. On this case, matrix matrix multiplication. And this is this is exactly my input matrix. This is exactly my A, right? My input matrix. And the Q is the orthonormal basis, which is which has the same because I assume it has full column rank. It has the same dimension as A. So it's this is my Q. And this is, this is the R matrix, this is the R, which is upper triangular matrix, n by n, square. And this is how you get QR decomposition. The Q is a matrix with orthonormal columns, and R is an upper triangular matrix. This is called QR factorization. And let me show you what such a QR factorization is good for. By the way, I, should, I guess I should uh, make a disclaimer that Bramschmidt is usually not how you will be computing QR factorization for real. Like in MATLAB, there are some advanced numerical techniques which are like more numerically stable than Bramschmidt and so on. But let, let, we, we don't need to go into those, those details. What I want to you show you is how to apply uh, the QR factorization to solve least squares problems to sort of conclude the chapter on least squares. So the last time I explained how do we get to the normal equations, right? The famous ATAX equals ATB, that's the normal equations. And if we, if we already computed the QR factorization of A, it turns out that solving this will be easy. I'm still assuming the matrix A has full column rank, by the way. I will, I will explain uh, later what, what can we do if the matrix A does not have full column rank. So if I start from the normal equations and I plug in the QR decomposition, let's see what happens. So my, my A is QR, right? So you have QR transpose, QR is also here. So I just substitute QR for A here. Here I apply the product rule for transposition. So this is RT, QT, QRX, right? Here I use the fact that Q has orthonormal columns, which means that QTQ is identity. So the QTQ goes away. And I'm left with RTRX equals RTQTB. So let's think about this for a second, about this RTRX equals uh, RTQTB. <coughs> so what is the dimension of RTR first of all? Yes. 
Well, actually, in this in this case, it's easy. It will only get complicated when the A does not have full column rank. So, okay, in in this in this easy case, it's fine. Right, because if A has full column rank, so uh, let's look at the R from the previous slide. So the R is a square <coughs> n by n matrix, right? And if I had full column rank, that means that all the pivot elements, all the elements on the diagonal, they must be non-zero, right? Because my input uh, columns of A, they were linearly independent. So there must be something non-zero, at least a small contribution of each of the columns, right? If I had their zero, that would mean they were literally dependent. Well, and because my pivots are non-zero, that means that R is invertible, right? Well, because R is invertible, that means mm -hmm. that R transpose is, of course, also invertible. That's just the same thing, transpose. So that means that I can multiply this formula from the left with uh, the inverse of R transpose, right? Basically, I can get rid of this. It's why, why I'm saying it in such such a long way, why, why not just like cross it away, is because when uh, R will not be square, you, you cannot just do that. So we need to be a little bit careful when mm. doing this because it's easy to make a mistake there. But here it's okay, thanks to my assumption that A has full column rank. So uh, we are left with uh, Rx equals QTB. <coughs> QTB is easy to do, right? That's just a matrix vector multiplication. And R is uh, upper triangle. So we can easily solve it by back substitution. So this is an elegant way how you can solve a uh, V squares problem using QR decomposition. And now uh, let's discuss a little bit the, the, the case when the, if the input vectors are not linearly independent. So I guess I should start by asking what goes wrong if I just take this algorithm, the Gram-Schmidt algorithm, and I feed it with linearly dependent vectors. What, where, where does it fail? So, so I get rid of this assumption of linear independence. And let's assume that there actually is linear dependence somewhere. So let's say specifically that vector number i, I don't know which one it is, will be a linear combination of the previous ones. Right, that means that's linearly dependent, right? So let's assume there is a case like this. So what happens in Gram-Schmidt? Let's assume that all the a1 to a i minus 1 that they are linearly independent. So the Gram Schmidt is certainly going to happily proceed until a i minus 1, right? And then we'll start working on a i and what's going to happen? Because that's a question if you really understood the idea of Gram Schmidt. Which maybe you need to some time to let it uh, soak in. <coughs> Well, what's going to happen? Uh, the, the vector AI will come in, right? And I'll s start subtracting the components of AI in all these, di all, all these directions, all, 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 all the Q directions, but they spend the same subspace as, as these. So what happens is that I actually subtract off absolutely everything. <laughs> so after I do this, this type of operation, I'll get zero, okay? And in this, in this phase where I'm dividing by the norm, I will divide by zero. And that's not good, right? And, I'll, I, and I will be unable to proceed. Okay. So putting a zero vector into orthogonal basis is not a good idea, right? That's that's good to keep in mind. Like I, I said, that like the the scale of the vector doesn't matter, but that's true as long as the vectors are not all zero, right? Putting a zero vector to orthogonal basis would not be a good idea because <coughs> then, then the, ortho, the, the normalization, of course, fails. You divide by zero. You cannot divide by zero. So how can we fix that? How can we fix the Gram-Schmidt process so it can digest linearly dependent vectors? It's actually quite simple. Uh, 
the fix is quite simple. The consequences are less simple, but also we can we can deal with them. So let's think about it. So what, what are we gonna do? Well, if we got a vector which is a linear combination of the previous ones, what simply and that means we get a zero there. Zero vector as one of the bi will be zero, right? So let me write it here. The bi is gonna be a zero vector. And what we're gonna do, we're simply gonna skip it. We'll just not put it on the output. We will just say, okay, so this means that the AI vector is not contributing anything. So we can as well not include this vector in our output. Okay. Well, if it's not in the output, then the normalization will certainly be happy because we don't have to normalize it. <laughs> but what are the consequences of this? So this way we fix the algorithm, right? We're not no longer dividing by zero, so that's good. But what are the consequences of this? Well, the consequences is that if I then write the QR decomposition just like I did before, so now I assume I have my A matrix, which is still M by N, but now it has <coughs> linearly dependent columns. So I relax the assumption of linear independence. I assume that it has linear dependent columns. So then what happens that my Q matrix, that's the orthonormal basis I get from this uh, Gram-Schmidt that does not output the zero vectors. It will not have N columns. It will only have R columns, so that R is the rank of A. And similarly, the uh, R, R matrix here, that will be R by N, right? So basically what, what happened is that b before this Q matrix had the same dimension as A, but because they are linear dependencies in A, I had to skip some of the Q vectors, so the matrix got a little bit thinner, okay? So specifically what is the, if I like scale up the R, and the R matrix is not going to be a square triangle, right? But instead is going to have the, what we call the, row echelon form. It's going to have a form like this. So let me just do my usual graphical depiction of that. So there will be some non-zero pivots here. There will be some elements everywhere else which are potentially non-zero. Okay. So then, okay, fine. So we, we can live with that, right? But then what, what, uh, what changes in our analysis if I want to use uh, the QR to, to solve uh, least square? So let's, let's, let's repeat. So the derivation, so if these are my normal equations, I again plug in the QR decomposition. So now, now I'm using this uh, QR decomposition. That's what I get from a general matrix. R, T, Q, T, so this is still fine, right? So this is still identity, certainly, right? The columns are still orthonormal, that's fine. So I still get the same uh, formula as before, R, T, R, X equals R, T, Q, T, B. But now I have to be much more careful because what is R, T, R? What is the dimension of R, T, R? It's N by N, right? That's what it was before. But uh, can I invert it now? I certainly cannot invert the R, right? It's, it's, it's not, not even square. So forget about inverting it. Can I invert the RTR? That's a square matrix. That's a chance to be invertible, right? Is it going to be invertible? So let me ask you, what is, to be invertible, it would have to have rank N. Right. What is going to be the rank of RTR? R, right? Because R looks like this. R, R has uh, R, so this is R by N. Yeah, capital R matrix has a lowercase r linearly independent <coughs> rows. So the rank of RTR is going to be also R. So RTR is not going to be invertible. I cannot just invert this. It would be like tempting to just like put, put it here, right? <coughs> Unfortunately, I cannot do that. And there is fortunately a different thing I can do. 
From what we discussed before, we know that the null space of RT is the same as the null space of RRT. That's what we discussed the last time, except that I'm using it now to the R transpose, but the same idea, right? So interestingly, RRT, what is the dimension of RRT? That's R by R, right? Matrix, because R was R by N, so if I do R, RRT, that's R by R, okay? So the dimension of the null space of R transpose, so if, if I transpose it, if I, okay, let me, let me do it, I guess. If I do RT, <coughs> I will get this. So there will be the first row goes here, right? Let's see if I can get it right. And there is this guy, there is two, and there is one here. That's R transpose, right? So what's what's gonna be the null space of R transpose? Or the dimension of the null space of R transpose? It has p pivots in all columns, so RT does have full column rank. Okay, so the dimension of this is gonna be zero. Well, consequently, the dimension of the null space of RRT is going to be zero because they have to be the same. And that means that RRT is invertible. And that's cool. Now we can invert something. RRT is invertible okay so watch watch this trick what can i do here <coughs> is the following i can uh, take this and i can use r r t inverse because i just showed you that we can indeed invert it r so this is this is by the way the pseudo inverse of r transpose and I can take this matrix and multiply uh, both sides of the equation from the left with this matrix. So let's see what happens if I do that. If I do RRT inverse R, and then I copy what I had here, so that's RTR X equals RRT inverse RRTQTB. Do you see how I got it? I took this formula and I multiply from both sides on the left with this. Okay. And what happens is that this is now identity. This is also identity. So I am back to the Rx equals QTB. <coughs> so now R is not square, right? But you know how to deal with this you know you know how to solve a linear system of actuation because this is a reduced uh, not reduced but this is a row echelon form so you can uh, still do uh, back substitution you need to invent something for the free variables you are free to pick whatever so if you pick zeros you, you that's that's totally fine and this way you can get a solution in this case so here we did not need the assumption that a has linearly de independent columns and this this is how you get how you can uh, work your way around it okay what does it mean geometrically by the way what what does it mean um, when i was drawing uh, previously these sort of geometric drawings when i'm like a projecting a vector onto a subspace which is spanned by some vectors Geometrically, the situation when I have linearly dependent columns of A corresponds to the fact that I have some linearly dependent vectors here that describe my subspace. So if I had like in a plane, if I had three vectors that would be spanning the plane, that's fine, right? Uh, they are not linearly independent. But what does it mean that the projection now is not uniquely determined, right? Because I have multiple choices how I can do linear combinations of these vectors and get to the same projection AX. The projection AX that is going to be unique, the projection itself, but the X is not going <coughs> to be, right? That's exactly because the A matrix has a non-trivial null space. So I can put there whatever from the null space 
and it will uh, still give me the same uh, ax because the vectors in the null space have ax equals zero, so I can add whatever, as many of them as I want. Okay, so I think this concludes that exhaust the topics of topic of these squares and conclude the chapter four in the textbook. So you are now all ready. Do you have any questions to this? If not, I will go quickly through uh, the practice problems. So the problem number one, that's, oops. Um, that's something you actually not find in Gilbert Strang. That's the thing we did here extra as an example application. But this, this is what you did for uh, one of the projects, right? It's just the multiplying the individual transformations. So if, <coughs> if, you, if you look at it again, you will, you will not have any problem with that. Now the a real linear algebra starts next. We need to find a reduced echelon form of A. So that's basically this, right? So again, these, these things you need to remember what they are, what is reduced uh, row echelon form and so on. So this, this, this was almost, re it would be reduced if, this w if these were ones and this was zeros, right? Then it would be reduced. So these things I need you to remember. And the reason why I don't think it would be particularly helpful to you to hedge up the definitions on a piece of paper is that you also need to have the skill to use the definitions. Okay, and the skill you can only acquire by uh, uh, practicing it. So try trying to solve this. So that's gonna be your homework, I guess, for the next time. It will not really be graded because the, the midterm will be graded instead. <laughs> so this is your way to prepare for it. So here you um, first find the reduced version on forum and then use it to determine the rank of the matrix and the subspace of special solutions, right? So if I ask what are the special solutions, or <coughs> then you uh, should know that this means it's a subspace and you should know how to express subspace, right? For example, by giving me a linearly independent vectors that generate subspace, okay? So here we are again looking at the linear system. And similarly, I want you to find the null space of A and find all solutions for a given right-hand side. So that's a similar type of example we did before. If you want to go back, the, the lecture will be on YouTube somewhere, solving systems, linear equations. I think I gave some example of that. Try to compute really something like this. Try to grab one of the examples in the book and compute it for yourself. I mean, do, do this one, but if you want to prefer really well, then try other examples too, just so you uh, know how the computations go. So you're not surprised <laughs> during the midterm. If there are any surprises, uh, so they come before that. And here is some sort of like simple math problems, I guess, or simple linear algebra problems. And I want you to determine some properties of vector. So of course you, as a matter of fact, you need to remember what, what these definitions mean, what is linearly independent, right? And then you also need to know how to actually determine if they are linearly independent. And those are like very simple question. I don't wanna give out the answers yet because uh, you will give them away on Monday. So you need to know what is a dimension, what is the column space, what is the null space. So basically all, all the things we discussed. You don't have to worry about, so here in the exams, you don't have to worry about the applications, right? When we talk about like the DCT and the transform coding and things like that. Those were the applications which you practice in the projects. And here, here the exam is basically about the theory and some computations. Here, this is, a this is something where the geometric intuitions are gonna be useful. So I assume you know uh, how to deal with the plane in a space. And then you can connect it to linear algebra. So this you need to know that P, what is the orthogonal complement? And there will be something with orthogonality, orthogonal matrices. Okay, so please, yeah? 
Um, can we expect this sort of similar format type of question on the midterm as there are? Other correct, questions? correct. I think there will be fewer of them because seven would be too many for uh, just an hour and a half, right? <laughs> But yeah, the, the format will be exactly the same. That's that's the point. Yeah, that will not be exactly the same question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, so the text. If I want to read like additional material from the textbook, the, it covers from chapter one to five. Right? To four, inclu no. including four. The top five is the determinant. That's what we are gonna do next after after the midterm. Yep. So are you gonna be doing review problems? Right, right. But I, not me, it will be you, <laughs> the TA, the, the lead TA. Okay. He will give you the solutions. He will show you the solutions. I also have the solutions worked out in the PDS. I will also post it later. I don't want to post it now because I really want you to try to solve it by yourselves. If you make a mistake you, on, on Monday, you will see where, where the problem is and you can still have time to fix it. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is your uh, homework, I guess, next to work on this. All right, okay. So let's end right here.